A lot of interesting stuff happens in the hallway. It happens, uh, you, you know, you get to walk out of, of a session and there's a collective experience that you just went through. And so there will be a hallway conversation that springs up discussing the material. Hi, I'm Christina Peterson. I'm from the University of Central Florida, and I'll be presenting today with Kenneth Lamar, and we will be presenting a persistent hash map for graph processing workloads and a methodology for persistent transactional data structures. So here's an overview of my talk. Um, I will introduce persistent memory, give some use cases, and explain the pitfalls, and then Kenneth is going to talk about his persistent hash map. He'll go over the design goals, methodology, explain how he achieves persistence, and then give some performance results. And then I'm going to um, present persistent transactional data structures. I'll give the design goals, the methodology, per and some performance results, and then we'll conclude with a live demonstration. So persistent memory is a new tier of memory. It sits right between DRAM and NAND SSD. And the benefits are that it's um, non-volatile storage, by the addressable, it provides higher density than DRAM and has access latencies closer to DRAM than storage. Persistent memory is commercially available through Intel Optane DC um, persistent memory, so it's in use today. So here's the traditional hierarchy. Um, we have our storage, which is the bottom tiers of, uh, of this hierarchy uh, that are non-volatile. And then we have the top tier, which is the volatile, this includes DRAM, the CPU caches, and CPU registers. Um, also, the, the cost goes up per gigabyte as we go up the tier, and then the latency decreases as we go down the tier. Um, so now we have persist the new memory hierarchy has persistent memory right in the middle. Um, it's uh, got it's non-volatile and has capacity that's close to NAND SSD, but it has latencies much closer to DRAM. And so there's um, design trade-offs for uh, any tier of memory. So here's some stati statistics of persistent memory compared to DRAM and NAND SSD. So DRAM is volatile, whereas persistent memory and NAND SSD are both non-volatile. So DRAM caps out for capacity about 64 gigabytes, and persistent memory is um, you know, max is at about 512 gigabytes typically. Uh, NAND SSD gets to about um, one terabyte in the general case. So persistent mem memory latency falls between about 0.1 and, and one microseconds. So NAND SSD, um, if we look at the fastest time of persistent memory, it's about a thousand times faster than NAND SSD. And if we look at the slowest latency of persistent memory, it's about 10 times slower than DRAM. So we can see that our latency is much closer to DRAM than to um, the NAND SSD. So endurance, DRAM is a clear winner. Um, it's got about 64 times 10 to the seventh petabytes written. Um, persistent memory has about 360 petabytes written, so that's a lot less, but it's about a thousand times better than NAND SSD. And then for the cost, I retrieved these costs around mid-October, um, so the prices are probably even have even gone up now since at this time. Um, but the uh, cost for DRAM for about 64 gigabytes is $5 per gigabyte um, for 128 gigabytes, which it's not common, but, but it's been done. Um, that's about 7.5 gigabytes. And the price per gigabyte is going to increase with increasing densities um, because it's difficult to pack a lot of DRAM into a single module. So if we were to be able to create DRAM at the capacity of persistent memory, it's going to be a lot more expensive than that $16.3 per gigabyte for persistent memory. And NAND SSD is 11 cents per gigabyte. So if you have memory that you want to store, but you're not going to touch it or update it, then NAND SSD is the way to go. Otherwise, persistent memory is a much better choice. So there's many use cases of persistent memory. Um, for metagenomics, the genome fragments can be um, stored in persistent memory, and a persistent hash table can be used to look up those genome fragments. For astronomy, um, an optical telescope may collect um, large data sets, and then a persistent indexing structure can be used to uh, maintain these data sets. 
And then for graph analytics, the structure of the graph can be stored in persistent memory. And then um, graph, graphs often have very computationally expensive operations. So we can use scalable checkpointing so that if we have a crash mid-operation, we can always revert back to that checkpoint and resume our operation without um, losing all that expensive uh, computation that we've done previously. So if we look at the common case, um, the common characteristics of these use cases, the, um, the data sets are very large. They can include up to trillions of data points. The, um, so we need high capacity. The data sets may also encounter a large number of updates, so we need high endurance. Also, data set updates are computationally expensive, so we want non-volatility for that, um, that checkpointing. And we also want low latency so that we can perform those, uh, those updates as quickly as possible. So let's take another look at our table. So um, for high capacity, NAND SSD is, is the clear winner here. But when we look at endurance, persistent memory has a much better endurance than NAND SSD. Also, um, we need non-volatility. So either persistent memory or NAND SSD satisfies that, that criteria. But persistent memory has latency that's not too far off of DRAM. It's only about 10 times slower than DRAM. So in this case, um, persistent memory is the happy medium. But with all these positives, there's also some pitfalls. In particular, there's architectural limitations. The uh, caches and registers are expected to remain volatile. So this can cause the persisted data to be in an inconsistent state if the stores prior to the crash were in the cache but not yet written to persistent memory. And so the instruction set architectures provide um, instructions for the designers to be able to ensure durability and ordering. So for example, the x86 ISA provides a cache line write back and, and um, that provides durability and then an S fence to provide ordering guarantees. But even the usage of the cache line write back and the S fence is problematic. So here's a very simple code example where we're going to do a compare and swap. And um, compare and swap is an atomic instruction accepts a memory location, an expected value, and a new value. And if the dereference value of the memory location is equivalent to an expected value, then the memory location is updated to the new value and true is returned. Otherwise, no change is made and false is returned. So let's take a look at this example. So um, assume that node A is initially connected to node D and that link is persisted. And so now we have thread one that wants to come and insert node B. So it's going to tr um, create node B, it's compare and swap succeeds, but then it's, it's delayed. So it never gets to persist that link. So then thread two comes along, it's going to see that, that link in the cache. So it's gonna go ahead and traverse to node B, it's gonna insert node C and persist those links. And then it's gonna successfully do the cache line right back in S fence. Now there's a crash. So what happens is that node B and node C are no longer reachable, but they were reachable in the state prior to the crash. So this violates crash consistency. So there have been correctness properties that have been defined to be able to, um, to define correctness for persistent data structures. Um, crash consistency is a property where um, an application um, can be reverted to a consistent state, recovered to a consistent state after the crash that was consistent with, with some state that was valid before the crash occurred. Now, this is good for reads and writes, but it doesn't account for data structure semantics. So that's where durable linearizability comes into play. So durable linearizability not only requires that the data, um, that the state, the recovered state is consistent with some state before the crash, but also that that state is consistent with uh, correct according to data structure semantics. And so for that reason, durable linearizability is one of the go-to correctness conditions for persistent data structures. And so um, we're gonna go into the design of a persistent hash map. And so Kenneth is going to take over. All right, hey there everyone. Um, so my name is Kenneth Lamar and I'm gonna talk about a persistent hash map design that I worked on in my research. So for starters, let's talk about the settings. So um, what we did was we partnered with Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, they have some experts on 
graph analytics problems, um, really large ones that deal with potentially billions of vertices. Um, and our lab mostly focuses on concurrent data structures, which are high performance um, data structures um, that allow threads to access that same shared data structure and shared memory. Um, and so we wanted to figure out how we could have a sort of meeting of the minds, how we could um, turn this into something useful with persistent memory. And so we decided to target the hash map. Um, it's a fundamental data structure, um, commonly used in graph analytics problems already, um, but we found that weren't, there weren't a lot of high performance, non-volatile memory options out there. So we set our design goals based around this graph analytics problem. Uh, so we wanted it to be read optimized, where persistence um, doesn't need um, to flush or fence after the first read, was kind of what we wanted to be able to do. Uh, we also wanted to prioritize runtime over recovery. So to, we wanted to persist as little as possible and recover as much as possible. We also wanted a compact representation with few cache misses. And so we accomplished that using arrays and an open addressing um, sort of layout. Um, and we also wanted to mi minimize the overheads of memory management because uh, persistent memory uh, allocators are relatively immature at this point. Um, so at this point, we decided to try to focus on allocating large table chunks. So the design that I worked on and published is uh, the persistent concurrent hash map, PMAP for short. It's non-volatile, so when it crashes, it can safely recover with these correctness conditions like Christina was discussing. It's lock-free, so we guarantee system-wide progress and it will scale up with multiple threads. Um, it uses an open addressing approach uh, where we have in-place keys and values rather than uh, a bunch of pointers. And uh, it's set to be resizable and it can both expand and shrink, which can be somewhat difficult in a lock-free environment, um, but I was able to pull it off. Um, and the operations we support include standard ones like insert, replace, remove, and get. Um, but we also um, support an update operation, which is an atomic conditional replace. Um, in a lock-free environment, you can't get a value and assume that it hasn't changed before you can run your replace. So this value was important so that we could make sure that that value matched what we expect. It's useful for things like perhaps a counter that increments. So here's uh, the design overview of my uh, PMAP design. Uh, so the way that it works is we have um, several different levels that are part of the resizing scheme. And the um, sections that are in gray are the persistent sections. Everything else is stored um, volatilely. And the reason we do that is because um, I, I've set it up in such a way that I can take what's persisted and use that to reconstruct the things that don't persist. Um, part of that idea of uh, persisting as little as possible. Uh, so um, we have the pairs, keys, and values. They're stored together in pairs right next to each other so that we can sort of have better cache locality, better direct access to those. Um, CHM stores sort of auxiliary data such as um, the number of free slots in that particular level, um, the total size in terms of how big that level is. Um, and uh, we have this mechanism where um, for resizing purposes, we have a pointer that points to a level and the level points to a newer level that might, for expansion and reduction. Um, so I'll go into a little bit more detail about how that resizing works later, uh, but this is the general layout. So now let's talk about the resizing approach. Um, so the resizing, and really most of this base, um, non-persistent aspect of the design is based on uh, Cliff Click's lock-free um, Java hash map. And so lock-free resizing is a challenging problem, um, especially in this case because keys and values um, are stored as separate atomic objects so that we can have larger keys and values. Um, but what that means is that partial operations are possible. So we might perform a migration and um, not necessarily have the key and the value show up at the same time. Um, so it's tricky to do that, but um, we managed to, the, the resizing scheme in Cliff Click's hash map um, accommodates that. Uh, when we uh, do a resize, we will allocate a table that is uh, typically gonna be twice or half of the uh, current table size and uh, link that in as the new table. Uh, and key value pairs are going to be individually migrated. Um, this process is concurrent, which means that multiple threads can work on this at the same time, and um, nothing's going to get in the way. If, if uh, one thread is in the middle of, say, a migration, another thread can identify that and help that migration complete so it doesn't have to wait. Uh, it's parallel, meaning that uh, multiple threads can do multiple uh, relocations at the same time. And um, interestingly, it's incremental, which means that 
we can actually continue operating on these keys without actually having to perform a full table migration. Uh, full table migrations are very popular in existing work, but um, if you do it incrementally, you can sort of amortize the cost of the migration. So the resizing, uh, what it does is it will reserve a bit that's used in each value, and that bit will indicate that a migration is in progress for that key value pair. And if a thread sees that, then it needs to help migrate before it can actually return that value. It needs to finish that migration so that that key is migrated to that top level before it's done. Um, but the problem is this resize bit cuts into our usable bits, so it's going to limit our values to 63 bits. Um, but it's useful to be able to have this resizing scheme at the cost of that bit. Um, once the migration is um, done for that particular key value pair, the old slot's gonna be replaced with a migration sentinel, and any um, thread that sees that will recognize that if they want to find the value associated with that key, that they need to go to a higher level. And also we have it set up so that once that um, slot is set as a migration sentinel, that means that you can't put another value in there. You need to go to a higher level. And so by that, in that way, we can make it so that eventually um, we have migrated all the slots, everything has a migration sentinel, we know that no thread can ever insert anything, and we can safely remove that particular level from our sort of scheme. So you can see in our example that we have one dot dat, and that's actually been removed from our, our sort of linked list of levels uh, because everything's been migrated. So I think sort of the more interesting aspect of this is how we added persistence. Um, so we want to sort of more generally be able to add persistence to existing concurrent data structures. Uh, and it's kind of a, a nice because we can leverage existing multi-threading guarantees that already exist. We already know that threads will view data in a consistent state um, relative to each other. We just need to extend it so that the memory also views everything in a consistent state. So here's um, sort of a, a naive initial idea that one might work, use, um, which is correct but not very performant, called flush on read. So flush on read has two rules. The first one is that if you create a new object, um, say like a node in a linked list, you need to persist the contents of that node and its pointer before you actually allow it to be to have access to shared memory. Um, and the second rule is that before you perform a read, you always have to flush any persistent pointer. And uh, the reason that's important is because uh, if you're performing an operation that's dependent on that previous read, you need to make sure that that has actually persisted so that we can view it um, with, uh, so that it has durable linearizability and crash consistency. So let's take a look at um, an example and some code. Um, so persist will um, flush a memory address and fence it to make sure that we don't have reordering. Uh, when you perform a read, it will, like we said, we always flush before read. So we run the persist, and then we can load the address once it's persisted. In the case of um, compare and swap, compare and swap is performing both a read and a write, um, and so we have to persist before we perform that read, um, and then we can perform the write, and that write will not immediately be persisted. So in our example here, um, this is the same example we had from before where we had that issue with crash consistency. Um, so we have um, node B inserted, and like I said, when you create a new object, you need to make sure that everything in that new object is persisted first. So we have node B persisted to node D right from the start when we first inserted it before we put it in shared memory. But when we change the pointer from node A to point to node B, we don't need to persist that right away. Um, in step two, we try to insert node C. And during traversal to figure out where node C goes, we'll, have, we'll persist um, on read that pointer from node A to node B so that we can figure out where node C goes. Uh, but we'll also persist the pointer from node B to node uh, D, uh, even though that's already persisted because our rule is to flush on every single read. Uh, and then we can insert node C with that next pointer already persisted, but the pointer from node B to node C is not persisted at that point. So maybe a better idea um, would be link and persist. Um, so link and persist has that same rule as before where we flush newly created objects. Um, but now what we want to do is we want to borrow an unused bit from a pointer. Um, so most architectures leave unused bits, so we're able to do this. And by having it contained within that pointer, we can essentially have a flag um, that we can atomically update alongside the pointer. So now what we'll do is whenever we perform a write, we will mark that pointer as dirty. And when you perform the first read, you'll, the, a thread can see that that bit is marked and that it hasn't been persisted yet. 
So before it's able to succeed in a read, it first has to persist that location, and then it can return um, the cleared uh, bit version of that value. And uh, sort of the worst case this could have, so typically it's gonna be on the first read, but in the worst case, um, all the threads try to read the same address at the same time, they all see that bit set and they all try to flush it. But in practice, it's normally just going to be the first read. So let's look at this example, same example again. Um, so persist is very similar to before where we have flush and fence, but now um, we are additionally going to, once we persist, do a compare and swap to remove that dirty bit um, to indicate that that value has been persisted. And now when we perform a read, when we load the value, we're going to check for that dirty bit. And if it's not marked as dirty, then we know that something's already persisted it, and so we don't need to persist it again. We can just return the value. Um, but if it isn't persisted, then of course we have to persist it that first time. And persistent compare and swap, uh, same thing. Um, so we have to load it because we're reading a value, check to see if that, um, that pointer has been uh, marked dirty, and if it is, then persist. And then when we return a new address with our compare and swap, um, now we have to um, or it, logical or it with that dirty flag so that we can mark that we performed a write and we don't know that it's durable yet. So in our example, um, same as before, we have that node B that we inserted. And when we set node B A to point to node B, we have to mark that link to indicate it's not persisted yet. So now in step two, when we go to insert node C and we perform our traversal, we'll see that bit is marked. We will um, persist and then remove the mark from the pointer from node A to, point B, uh, to node B. And then when we go from node B to node C, we don't need to persist that again. We already know that there's no mark there. Um, but then when we assign, uh, update the node pointer from node B to node C, uh, at that point, we will mark that as dirty. And then subsequent threads that go in can clean that. And of course, because we don't know it's persisted, so like in this case, uh, at the end, we don't know for sure node C might be lost, but it's still okay because it's still in a consistent state that was um, at, at correct at a previous point in time. So th that example was dealing with linked lists. My hash map is array based. And so um, the sort of concept for flushing new objects before introducing them is when you allocate a new level, you have to make sure that you flush all of the default empty values for that table at that level. Um, and um, sort of a contribution of my work is to um, extend the flush, the link and persist to apply to data rather than just pointers. Um, so remember, um, so this will also cost one bit per value. And if you remember, the resizing scheme also cost a bit. So this means that effectively we're limited to 62-bit values. Um, we consider this a reasonable trade-off for our use cases. If you're doing, th um, when we worked with uh, Lawrence Livermore, they suggested that the scheme of reducing the persists was more important than necessarily having access to all of the bits. And if we really needed an object larger than 62 bits, that object could just be a pointer and that would be acceptable. So recovery. Um, so when we recover, so our recovery works by only persisting the keys and the values. Um, and we accomplish this um, by, uh, because we can, the idea is that we can rebuild everything else. So the only other data that's made persistent, uh, we use file system data to infer the contents. So we use PMEM in a FS DAX mode, file system direct access, so that we can sort of memory map these levels as if they're files, um, but still have direct access to them through P PMEM. And um, so as a result, we can infer certain data. So for instance, the size of the file we can use to figure out how big a level is. Um, I've set up an atomic counter for the naming of each of these levels so that when you perform recovery, we know what order to actually um, reconnect the list of levels back together. Um, and so we can use this to figure out um, that sort of information. And then for things like um, the number of keys that are currently in there, you can just, during recovery, iterate over um, that particular level to figure out how many keys are physically there, right? Because we already know the layout of this structure. So now let's talk about um, the related works that I compared against. Um, so the most similar to our own is um, called concurrent level hashing. And this is also a lock free design. It also uses open addressing, um, but it doesn't uh, have open addressing on pointers. It only has them, or on values, it only has them on pointers. And uh, it supports resizing like ours does, but it only supports expansion. You can't make it smaller down the line for memory reclamation. Uh, we also compare it against the hash map in one file. One file is a framework to convert data structures into weight free transactional equivalents if they're node based. So they have a node-based hash map that's in their design, 
um, that we compare against. Um, we also compare it against just the STL um, hash map. It's volatile um, and it's not concurrent, so we just use a global lock. This was just basically to have a baseline. And we also used uh, the persistent memory development kit hash map. So PMDK has a lot of off-the-shelf um, persistent memory functionality. Um, and so we leverage that. It's based on the Intel thread building blocks concurrent hash map, and it uses reader writer locks to accomplish its concurrency. Our testing environment, we used um, two 20-core 40-thread Intel Xeon processors uh, with 134 gigabytes of volatile DRAM and 248 gigabytes of persistent Optane DC memory. Uh, the Optane was configured in AppDirect mode with direct access mode um, so that we can map things to files. Uh, we also, of course, our code was written in C++ and compiled with GCC9. Uh, our test configuration used 62-bit keys and values just to make sure we had parity um, with our limit of 62 bits. Um, and our table capacities for open addressing um, options were was 2 to the 14th initially. And we performed uh, no garbage collection on our initial implementation just because I wanted to make sure I benchmarked the data structure rather than the garbage collection system. So now let's talk. So this is just a, an excerpt from my performance testing. So this is an alternating test. What it'll do is it'll fill the table up to about 50% capacity and then alternate between insertion and remove operations, 50-50 split. And uh, it performs 400,000 operations and we measure the time to complete. So the y-axis is the time to complete in milliseconds. Lower is better. Uh, and so you can see our gray line PMAP tends to take the shortest to run, especially at scale. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today for the PMAP design. And I'll uh, hand it back over to Christina. Thanks, everyone. If I'm understanding, uh, really the only thing you can map here is like an integer to an integer. I, 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 can I put a string as the value, for example? I mean, the way you're storing it has to certainly be Right. So, so what, the question was um, basically, does this only apply to integers or could you pref uh, apply it to something like strings? So in my base design, I'm doing just 64 bit or 62 bit integers um, for keys and values. But um, it does, it, it's designed so that it can support arbitrary data types. Um, so you could make it so that it was a pointer to say a string of arbitrary length if you wanted to. That would have performance implications, but it would work um, I also didn't deal with persisting, say, whatever that pointer points to. So that would be a separate problem as well. Right. So uh, could you modify the design so that if you did have a string, for example, as a value, um, you could persist it directly, you know, in in the same uh, memory as the key. So the way I have it set up right now, the level is just on its own, and you would have to do a separate allocation if you wanted to persist that. Okay. Uh, last question. Uh, you know, flat map for performance reasons uh, is a very common pattern these days, right? And in flat map, there's a separation between the key storage and the value storage. Too. Mm. In other words, and, and it takes advantage of, you know, cache, um, you know, hotness and so forth by, uh, you know, uh, bringing, doing things. Because a lot of times you're doing a query on the hash table that never involves the actual value. It's, it's part of the observation. So in a large number of cases, you only ever have to look at the keys and you don't even have to look at the value. So the the basically the comment was uh, have I tried using um, separating the keys from the values since there are often cases where um, just the keys are accessed in a particular operation. So I, I haven't tried that, but I do think that that's very interesting. I'd be interested in exploring that. All right, thanks everyone. I'll hand it over to Christina now. Okay, I'm going to continue with persistent transactional data structures. 
So let's look at the taxonomy of transactional data structures. Um, we're going to look at transactional versus non-transactional, and then also high-level data structure semantics, and then low-level reads and writes. So if you just want to write, um, write code with low-level reads and writes and you want persistency, all you really need is cache line writeback and sfence. You have to use those with caution, but um, they will persist your, your reads and writes. Now, if you want some data structure semantics, you need to um, you know, include um, uh, design using persistent data structures. And there's been several persistent data structures in, in literature that have been proposed. Now, if you want um, transactional uh, support, there have been persistent transactional memories in literature, but they synchronize on the low-level reads and writes. Um, one benefit is that if you synchronize on high-level semantic conflicts, you can get, get performance gains. And there was a gap in this, uh, in this research area. And so we filled that gap with persistent transactional data system for linked data structures, which we call Petra. So the design goals of Petra are that we want high performance, and we achieve this through um, low overheads uh, added for durability, um, and then high scalability. Uh, performance, um, we want performance that scales very well as we increase the number of processes. And also we want non-blocking guarantees. We want to guarantee that there's going to be system-wide progress. So to achieve high performance, Petra keeps the number of cache line fences and memory, the flushes and fences low by persisting only the transaction descriptor. So the transaction descriptor has um, all the information needed to execute the operations of that transaction. And so for this reason, if we just persist the transaction descriptor, we can leverage it as a redo log if there's a crash. And we can use that log to verify consistency and correct any possible inconsistencies. But this is optimized for the failure-free execution. So if there's a recovery, our recovery is quite expensive. And, um, but we get better performance in the, the common case of no crash. And for high scalability, um, Petra achieves high scalability by doing transactional synchronization only for high-level semantic conflicts, which are on the nodes themselves. All of those low-level conflicts, those can be handled using thread-level synchronization techniques, such as like lock-free programming or, or locking techniques. Um, this eliminates false aborts, so we get better, higher throughput because we get more committed transactions. Um, another optimization, sorry, optimization that we do is that we do a logical rollback. We don't need to revert back to the um, correct state after an abort because what we do is we do an, an, an interpretation of the correct abstract state and then we can make decisions based on that interpretation without the expensive physical rollback. Finally, Petra is non-blocking, and it is able to achieve a non-blocking technique um, in enforcing transactional synchronization by using a helping scheme in conjunction with compare and swap. So what it's going to do is when a transaction detects a conflict, it's going to help complete that transaction. It's going to go through every operation, and it's going to persist that transaction descriptor before going back to its own um, operation. And so this is how we are able to enforce transactional synchronization without explicit locking. And so this way we avoid potential deadlock scenarios or anything that might uh, prevent progress. So Petra achieves obstruction freedom. This means that a single process executed in isolation is guaranteed to make progress. We're not lock-free because we have the potential for infinite help, helping um, recursions if two uh, transactions attempt to access nodes in opposite order. So let's take a look at some of our type definitions to get a, a feel for how Petra is structured. So first we have a transaction status. It's either active, committed, or aborted. The persistent status is maybe in progress or persisted. So maybe means that we, we're still trying to do the transaction. We haven't even attempted to persist the transaction descriptor. In progress means that we've completed this transaction. We're trying to persist our transaction descriptor. So this way, other threads can help us persist the transaction descriptor if they, if they access a node that, that points to our transaction descriptor. Finally, persisted means that we've, we've persisted this transaction descriptor. And all operations are considered to be persisted at that point. 
So our operation type um, is insert, delete, or find, because we're dealing with sets in, for this case. And then for our operation, we have a type and a key. So the descriptor, this is our transaction descriptor. It has a size, a transaction ID, a status, a persistent status, and then a list of operations. This is how other threads can help complete a pending transaction because they can reference this list of operations and help complete it. Um, and then we have a node info which has a descriptor and an operation ID and that node info is embedded in the node. So this is how all other um, transactions that access nodes can go and find that transaction operation list and help complete transactions. So here's the Petra methodology overview. First we create a transaction descriptor and then we start our transaction. So it's pretty straightforward. We just go ahead and execute our operations and then we just keep, keep going. If the operation is successful, we, we just keep executing operations. If any of them fails, we're going to um, abort the transaction to preserve that all or nothing property of transactions. Um, otherwise, once we've finished all our transactions, we're going to attempt to commit the transaction. And then um, we're gonna set the transaction status using a compare and swap. And then finally, we're going to set the persistent status also using a compare and swap. And this is when our transactions persisted. So now I'm gonna go into more details on this execute data structure operation. So before I get into the details of the execute data structure operation, I'm going to give a little bit more background on the underlying transaction management for Petra. So Petra uses lock-free transactional transformation, which we abbreviate LFTT. So LFTT is actually a lock-free version of transactional boosting. And what transactional boosting is, is it does high-level semantic conflict detection and uses um, for transactional synchronization um, using abstract locking. And then all thread-level conflicts like traversing a, a list or trying to swing an X pointer, that's all handled using a base concurrent data structure. It could be a lock-free data structure, it could be a lock-free um, locking or, or lock-free. Um, but that's all handled using a base concurrent data structure. And so that's gonna be indicated by the do underscore function. That's coming from the base concurrent data structure. So what we do here is we're gonna start a compare and swap based loop. And then we're gonna do a do locate pred, which means that we're using the base concurrent data structure to do a thread safe traversal to the node of interest. And so then we check to see if the node is present. So if the node is not present, that means there's no ongoing transaction, it's not even there. So that means we can just go ahead and do our operation from the base concurrent data structure. We didn't need any, tra any transactional synchronization for that. Now for, if there is, the node is present, then there could be an active transaction. And that's when we're gonna call update info. Update info is the procedure that will go and check to see the status of a, the node's transaction. And if it's active, it needs to help complete that transaction and it's gonna take it all the way to persisting the transaction descriptor before even starting its own operation. So then once it gets to its own operation, the operation may succeed or fail, which is gonna pass it back to that execute transaction function. Um, but if our compare and swap fails, then we have to just retry that entire loop. So here's an example of Petra in action. So we have three threads. The first thread does an insert three, insert one. Thread two does an insert four, insert two. And then thread three does uh, delete three, delete four. So each of these transactions have to create a transaction descriptor. And we assume that the, the, the list is initially empty. So for the first transaction descriptor, we have node one and node three, and those descriptors are gonna point to T1. So then thread uh, three is gonna come along and it's gonna do a delete three. So now it has to point its transaction descriptor to T3. Um, thread two is gonna come along and it's gonna do an insert four. So that's gonna point to T2. But what happens is when thread three does a delete um, four, there's a conflict there. So it has to help complete thread two's transaction. So if this were to play out, it would help complete the transaction, persist it, and then finish off its own operation. But that's not what happens in this example. In this example, we have a crash. And so what happens is that since T2 and T3 were never persisted, they're lost. We, those are considered um, not persisted, only T1 was persisted, and so that's the only one that should be recovered um, after the crash. <clears throat> 
So now I'm going to go into the, um, the recovery. So this is, is a pretty big flow chart. And as I said before, our recovery is expensive. So what we do is we, we have our persisted transaction descriptors, and so we're able to read them. So what we're going to do is create a KD map. This is a map that maps keys to descriptors. So what we have to do is go through each transaction and go through each operation, and we need to map it to the correct descriptor. So what's going to happen is as we start populating with descriptors, if the um, descriptor that we're looking at happens after the descriptor in the map, we're going to replace it because we want to know what was the most recent descriptor to access this node. And so we keep doing this until we've gone through all the operations. So now we're going to verify the consistency of whatever the remnants of that list was. So we're going to traverse through that list, and this is at the bottom part of the flowchart, and we're going to see if the node, the descriptor that um, is associated with that node, is the correct descriptor based on our KD map. And then um, if it's not, we have to just remove the node and execute the operation all over again. Otherwise, we need to check the value, the, the contents of no, the node. And if that's valid, it's consistent. Otherwise, we delete that node and just re-execute that operation. So we've tested Petra on um, Intel second Xeon, um, Xeon scalable processors codenamed Cascade Lake. It has 48 cores, two sockets. It supports 96 threads. The main memory consists of Intel Optane DC persistent memory with six terabytes total capacity. And the, um, it also has 768 gigabytes of DRAM. And we place all persistent data structures in persistent memory. DRAM stores everything else. The operating system is Ubuntu 18.04. And then um, our application and microbenchmarks are compiled using GCC 7.4 with the O3 optimization flag and the C++14 standard flags. So for our microbenchmarks, we have um, the different operation radi ratios. Um, right dominated is going to be list and map is 40%. Um, for list, we have insert 40%, map uh, 30%. For uh, list, delete 20%. And then, sorry, delete is 40%, um, find is 20%. For the maps, delete is 30%, 10% um, update, and then 20% find. For redominated, we have our 10% update, 10% delete. For list, we have 80% find, and for map, we have 5% update and 75% find. The number of transactions is um, linked list is 100k, 100,000. The other data structures is a million, and then for the key range, we have 10,000. For the linked list and the other data structures is a million. We had to keep the linked list test size lower because um, it's an O of n time to to do a traversal through the list. And, and that's quite a bit more than the logarithmic search time of the other data structures. So here's our example of our, um, the results for our linked list and our map. And the left is the right dominated uh, workload, and the, the right is the redominated workload. We test for either transaction size one or four, and we're comparing Petra to a non-transactional durable sets to LFTT, to one file, Romulus, and PMDK. So if we look at the linked list example, um, Petra is, um, performs the best and is the, the most scalable. Uh, LFTT also scales similarly to Petra because um, it's the underlying transaction management system for Petra. So the other transactional management, um, persistent transactional memories do not scale as well, and that's because they're synchronizing on the low-level reads and writes. Um, the gap between the performance get, closes a bit for the redominated workload, and that's because um, the other persistent transactional memories are optimized for read-only, whereas Petra is still allocating descriptors for read operations, so there's no um, performance benefits for a read-only, redominated workload. And then for the map, since we're able to execute more operations, we're getting um, we, the overhead of Petra starts to catch up with itself. And so um, the non-transactional non durable sets and LFTT are, are performing the best here. And that's because non-transactional durable sets does not have the overhead of um, transactions, and LFTT does not have the overhead of persistency. Um, and then once again, the map, we, we see that the performance gap closes a little bit, but Petra still outperforms the other persistent transactional memories. So here's our skip list and our MD list. It performs very similarly to the, um, um, to the uh, map. Uh, the uh, Petra um, 
performs better than the other transactional memories, but um, the non-transactional durable sets in LFTT outperform Petra for the skip list, and then, um, but the, the performance trends looking at um, with comparing Petra to the other persistent transactional memories is quite similar with Petra still outperforming the other approaches. So here's our, um, our uh, TATP transactional processing workload, and we compare Petra to OREC, Ring, STM, coarse grain locking, um, and then no rec, and then the TL read, reader writer lock. So Petra is the only one that scales well. The other persistent transactional memories scale to about 16 threads, and then they start to lose some scalability. And then the TL uh, reader writer lock, that scales quite well, um, all up until 48 threads is actually timed out, but it, it scales well because it doesn't require quiescence for the commit phase, so that helped um, it to keep its scalability um, pretty well up to 48 threads. So now we're gonna do our live demonstration. And we're gonna do this from our AMD Epic server back in our, our lab in um, the University of Central Florida. It has 32 uh, cores and 64 logical processors. For the compile op optimi um, operate op sorry, options, I had to um, indicate that we need to use the DRAM allocator. And then for um, the persistent write back, we have to change that to a cache line flush. And so if you look at the code below, um, what we do is we, we define that, that um, PWB as a, a cache line flush. So we have to do an inline um, assembly call for the cache line flush. And then um, that provides strong enough ordering, ordering guarantees that we don't need to really assign any instruction for PFENS. And then we don't need the PSYNC. So this is just, this is not a persistent memory system. So our micro benchmarks include an operation ratio of 33% insert, 33% delete, and 34% find. Um, the number of transactions is 10,000, and our key range is 10,000, so that the, the test doesn't take too ter terribly long. Um, so let me go to the, uh, the test. And make sure I'm still connected. We're gonna have to re reaccess the system, and then we're gonna go to the correct directory. Okay, so we're gonna run the script. And then run our GNU plots. Okay, so we're first we're starting off with the list. And um, we're only gonna go up to about 32 threads. Um, we can see that Petra is scaling quite a bit um, better than the other approaches. Um, we're comparing to Romulus and one file, and that's because um, Romulus and one file synchronize on the, the low level reads and writes. And so Petra is gaining a lot of scalability because we're only doing transactional synchronization for conflicts on the nodes themselves. And um, also we're benefiting from a, a logical rollback. And so we can see that we, um, Petra does quite a bit better than um, the linked list. Um, the others are gonna go quite fast because their log, ro sorry, logarithmic search time is gonna, is gonna make the test go fast. So I'll just have to talk about those one by one as they finish. Okay, I think it's all done. So we've already talked about the linked list. Um, the skip list is, um, so we get a lot more throughput because we're, we have a lot logarithmic search time, so we're, we're seeing much higher numbers here for operations per second. We're still seeing, seeing the same scalability for Petra, and um, so that's um, due to the, the high level semantic conflict detection. Then for, um, let's go to the MD list. Okay, the MD list did not, okay, sometimes it will, will clip it a little bit. So what I'll do is, um, let me talk about the map and then I'm gonna just run the, the plot script again, it should show everything. So for the map, the, um, the throughput starts off really high. Um, that's because um, at, at this like single threaded case, each transactional um, persistent, the chance of accessing a different node is quite high. And so if there's no conflicts, all the approaches are gonna do very well. And so we can, we actually see like Romulus and OneFile doing much better because they don't have conflicts. But as we introduce more threads, 
we're getting more conflicts on keys, and so that's when we start to see Petra outperform the other approaches. So even though it looks like we, we tank in performance, we still have a very high operation throughput. It's just that we're dealing with conflicts, which always slows everything down. Um, let me just run the plot script one more time to see if I can get the full MD list. It just eclipses it sometimes. Yes, yeah, the MD list is full now. Um, so let me just look at the MD list. All right. So for the MD list, it's very similar scaling. Um, how the MD list is structured is that it has, um, uh, it arranges all the child nodes in n dimensional space. So this is um, a, like a logarithmic search time. So it's going to perform very similarly to the skip list. And once again, we see that Petra is outperforming the other approaches due to its high level semantic conflict detection. So I'm going to pop back into my presentation and we're going to finish it up. So the key takeaways here are that persistent memory provides a new tier of memory, it's non-volatile, it has high capacity, and the access latency is very close to DRAM. So this makes it a very practical um, memory for many use cases for scientific, scientific applications that are dealing with large quantities of data that have computationally expensive operations. And our persistent hash map, it uses open addressing. So this provides a low memory overhead and improved cache locality, which is also very um, essential for graph processing workloads. Um, and then Petra provides very high scalability, um, scalable durable transactions due to its high level semantic conflict detection. And so the source code for our persistent um, map is available at the uh, UCF GitHub PMAP. And then um, for Petra, it's available under my GitHub handle under Petra um, non PMAP. So this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Yes. You mentioned that uh, Petra uses a transactional transaction script for rebuilding transactions as well. That's correct. Uh, and, uh, is that something where you can introduce the concept of an invisible read, or does management ever require that you actually have that uh, transaction block? Um, yes. So the question is, um, since Petra requires a transaction descriptor for reads, um, and that introduces overhead, is it possible to treat some reads as invisible or do some sort of optimization to eliminate that overhead? of the, the, the descriptor. And we did look at this, this option for, um, for, read, for the, the read-only transaction case. What we could do is we could decide that we were going to pick like a, a serialization point like at the beginning so that we would always read, we would always assume that, we, we would look at the current state and always like kind of backtrack to the, the older values so that anything that happened after, during that transaction, we could just assume that that transaction like linearized at the start of the transaction. And so we, we can like do a read where we read the old value just assuming that we're, we're linearizing at that beginning of that transaction. And so we, that would help us for if every single operation was read only. We can't do that for um, if they have any write operations because then that could potentially conflict with another transaction. And so we, we can't just make that assumption that it, it linearizes at the start. So that's the, the case that we were able to look at some optimizations for. Um, I think Kenneth did this for his um, transactional vector that he had done. So uh, we, we did actually implement this. Um, but we couldn't think of any other ways to, to get in, to avoid the, the descriptors for reads if, if we were going to have some writes a part of that transaction. Um, but we are definitely, if you have any ideas, we are very welcome, welcoming. Yes? A clarification. Um, the difficulty is that you get this transaction, you don't know ahead of time whether it's read-only until you get through it. Is that, is that what you're telling me? No, we know ahead of time that it's read-only. Um, and so what we do is we just assume that the transaction is going to we, you, with a linearization point, it's kind of like the point in which the transaction takes effect. So we just make an assumption that the linearization point is right at the start. So we, we always, when we access a node, 
we, we always read the old value because we assume that we linearize at the very start. And so um, that way we, we don't need to do the whole like synchronization with transaction descriptors for the read only case. The individual transaction is, so the, the question is, is it the whole workload or the just the transaction? And the, the answer is that it's just the, the transaction by itself is a read-only transaction. Yes, you're welcome. Yes? So I think this, I don't know if you've studied this kind of workload, but in non-trivial systems these days, there are workloads that are sort of write ones, read many. Um, do you have an opinion on whether persistent um, memory would be a good choice for that particular OK, so the question is, um, there are some workloads with, is it write once, read man many? Yeah, so the, I basically think about um, you know, IoT telemetry, for example, right? Yeah. A measurement on the sensor uh, is a time order thing, and um, you know, you just write that, you never update it, but then you might have analytics that are going to look at that, um, and over the long period of time, you probably want to flush that to another tier of storage, right? Because it becomes less valuable later. Yeah, yeah. It seems like you would definitely want kind of like a a hybrid design where um, for that like write once, read many, where you might want to um, maybe start it in persistent memory and then migrate it to the like NAND SSD as you, when you're not touching that memory. So I, I, would, I would think a hybrid design would be the way to go for that. Um, I haven't looked into that, but um, that is something I would look at for future workloads. Um, for, for micro benchmarking. So thank you for that. Any other questions? There is a question from online audience. Does the performance analysis include any resize operation? Um, does the performance testing include any resizing operations? Right. Um, so for the data structures that I tested, there was no need to resize because they were um, they were list based. But Kenneth, his vector, um, Kenneth, did you have any resizing? Don't turn it on. Come up here before you turn it on. Yeah, so I, I guess that would be a question about um, Petra or about uh, PMAP. Because if it's about PMAP, there is resizing in, in PMAP. Um, I didn't um, test it extensively. I don't have results on that. Um, I was more concerned about it being um, correct and not having to just totally stop what was going on. Um, but I don't have any specific um, results. All right, no more questions? All right, Mr. Sam, thanks everyone.